So the last section, 74, is on what we call trig identities. And the whole kind of goal with trig identities is to take a formula that has trig in it, and it looks kind of complicated, and try to make it look simple. Here's an example. Don't write that yet, because I haven't taught you how to do it. But if you take cotangent and divide by cosecant, we can simplify that. that that's kind of complicated. And I'm going to show you how, how you simplify it. So we're not really dealing with, with uh, numbers in the sense of like finding answers to equations in this section. So you're not really going to need a calculator for it. graphing scientific. It won't, it won't, it won't help you. So I'm going to put up the identities that we've talked about so far, but just remember that an identity is an equation that is always true. So when we talk about trig identities, we're going to talk about formulas that are true all of the time. It's not like the formula is only true if you use certain values, like Pythagorean theorem. That's kind of like an identity. It works for any right triangle. It's not like Pythagorean theorem only works some of the time. It works all of the time, no matter what values you plug in in a right triangle. All right. So we should already know some of the identities, um, and I think you've written some of them down before. Uh, I'll put them all on the board again. If you want to write them all again, you can. It's possible we never wrote down this last group. But I know we did the other two groups. The reciprocal identities we have to use every time we type something in on the calculator that's not sine, cosine, or tangent. Because we don't have buttons for secant, cosecant, and cotangent. So like, how would you type in cotangent if you wanted to graph it on the calculator? Yep. One divided by tangent. Yeah, one divided by tangent. That's the one I just asked you about. One divided by tangent is the cotangent. So these identities basically say which trig function you can flip and what it turns into. If you flip tangent, you get the cotangent. If you flip the sine, you get the cosecant. And if you flip the cosine, you get the secant. And most of the time we don't do this, but if you then took the cosecant and flipped it, you would get the sine. So that's the connection. You flip cosecant, you get sine. You flip sine, you get cosecant. So those are what we call the reciprocal identities. And then we have another one for tangent. Does anybody remember another way that you can write tangent? Besides one over cotangent. There's a way you can write tangent in terms of sines and cosines. Well, think about the unit circle. When we did unit circle, this is a little different, but it'll kind of probably help you get the idea. Um, when we did unit circle, sine was equal to what letter? On the chord, yeah. Y. Sine was y. What was the cosine? X. X. And what was the tangent? Y over X. The tangent was the y over the x. So that means tangent is really the what over the what? Yep. Yeah. Sine so over cosine. It's the sine over the cosine. Yeah. And cotangent. Well, you can do the same idea because cotangent is just tangent flipped. So. If tangent is sine over cosine, then cotangent is cosine over sine. So these are the ones that we should be pretty familiar with. This last group we've never done before. Okay, so I'm not I'm gonna give them to you. Uh, we really don't go through the proofs of them. That's a little beyond what what we do. Uh, but we use them to simplify problems. Okay, and there's three of them. That's the first one. If anybody really wants to know why it's true, yeah, I can go with you and show you. Uh, not right now, but I, I can. 
And remember what this means when you put an exponent of 2 in the middle like that. That's a notation you can only use on paper. It means to take the sign and then square your answer. That's what it means. So sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. Always. It doesn't matter what angle you fill in. Say you pick 30 degrees. You take the sine of 30 degrees and square it. Take the cosine of 30 degrees and square it, and add them together, you will get one. Another Pythagorean identity is 1 plus tangent squared equals secant squared. So we got an identity that involves sines and cosines. We got one that involves tangents and secants. What do you think the last one is going to involve? Yeah. Um, cotangent and cosecant. Yeah, the cotangent and cosecant, the only ones we haven't used. And they all look kind of similar. They all have trig functions squared. They have a 1 in them. Um, and they're called Pythagorean identities because they, they kind of look like you're squaring something and then squaring something else, which is what you do in Pythagorean here. Now, these are really good identities to write down on a reference sheet. They're not something you want to spend a ton of time trying to memorize. Obviously, if you are familiar with them, then it makes the work you do faster. But there's nothing wrong with just looking these up when you need to use them. But these ones, these are ones I have memorized. These, I know these ones. There's, these are three groups. There's a lot more. Okay? There's a few more groups I have memorized, but overall, I mean, there's thousands of these. I don't, I don't know them all. A lot of times, if I need one, I would just go look it up and figure out what it is. But the fundamental ones are the most common ones that that people remember. Everybody have those identities. Okay, and this is taken from your book, so if you go on um, Google, or, yeah, Schoology, and you pull up section 7.4, this table is in that section. That's right. So the whole point of working with trig identities is to take a problem that looks complicated and make it look simpler. Why would you do it? Well, the reason comes up more when you get to calculus. All we do in this class is simplify the trig identity. We don't go beyond it and then start doing calculus with it. But that would be the next step, and that's the whole reason why you do what we're doing. So this is kind of like the, it's like the background work that you would do for a calculus problem before you actually start the calculus. So there's a few different tricks that we can use to simplify trig identities. And one trick that works a lot of the time is to change everything in the problem that's not a sine or a cosine into sine and cosine. And the hope when you do that is that you get something to cancel out and you get a simpler formula. So that when now you have to do the calculus stuff with it, you have something simpler and not as complex. So that's what we'll we'll try to start. We'll try changing everything in the problem that's not sine and cosine into sine and cosine. Because every single trig function can be written with just sines and cosines. Try an example. So the first one is cotangent divided by cosecant. It, what makes that complicated? It's two different trig functions and is a division in the problem. I mean, it's not the most complicated thing, but it, it still is more complicated than it needs to be. So before we would do any work with this in calculus, we want to simplify that as much as we can to make life easier. So we start with cotangent. How can I rewrite cotangent 
so that it only has sines and cosines in it. And if you're thinking 1 over tangent, yes, you can, but that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for sines and cosines. Yeah? Would you do cosine x over sine x? Yep, just make sure your argument matches. Oh, yes. What they do, a lot of times when people do these types of problems, they don't even write the argument down. That's getting a little lazy. Um, so we'll, we'll write it. But yeah, we're using theta. Okay. And what about cosecant? One over sine. Now you do everything here just like you would do with arithmetic problems. You can use distributive property, you can combine like terms. Well, we have a fraction divided by a fraction. If this was all numbers, how do you divide two fractions? Yep. Uh, flip the second one and then divide. Okay, so multiply, you said flip the second one. Anything else? Uh, you can cross cancel. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure what you, what I want to put here. Oh, um, you would put the cosine uh, theta over the sine a. Right. Keep the top the same. You change the problem to multiplication, and you flip the one that's in the bottom. And now, when you multiply, what did you say is going to happen? You cross cancel. Yeah, whenever you're multiplying, not when you're adding or subtracting, but whenever you're multiplying, if you have the same thing in the top and in the bottom of a fraction, you can cancel it out. So what am I left with? Yeah? Cosine over one? Yeah, just cosine over one, which really, you just say cosine. So this is exactly the same as this. And this is a much simpler thing to deal with if we had to do another step. It's a single trait function, and there's no division or multiplication. It's much simpler. Where exactly do you get the cosine over sine? Like for the fraction? That's the identity from the page we were just on. So if you look in that table, that, that's a formula in that table. Any questions on that? Let's try another one. Um, let's try cosecant times tan. Yeah, it's more complicated than it needs to be because you have two different trig functions and they're being multiplied together. Let's start with cosecant. What can I change that to? Yeah? One over sine x. Sine. Oh, sorry. Theta. Theta. So we have 1 over sine times, uh, what can we change tangent to? Yeah. Would it be 1 over cotangent theta? Or? It would be, but that's not going to help us. But you're not wrong with that. It's just not going to get you anywhere. Yeah? It would be sine over cosine. It would be sine over cosine. This is where you start to run into problems with trig identities. There's lots of ways to do them. I'm not saying you couldn't do it the way that he mentioned, but it is not going to be the most efficient way, and it doesn't lead us anywhere. So now we're multiplying, and look what happened. What, what can I do there? Cancel sine. We can cancel the signs, and we're left with 1 over cosine. Now, at that point, you have to kind of look at it and say, is that as simple as I can make it? You don't actually know when, when, when you're done with this kind of problem. But I would argue if you can write this as not a fraction, then it is simpler than having a fraction. Is there a way to write 1 over cosine so that it is not a fraction? That's just secant. That, that's just secant. So this times this always equals that. It does not matter what number you fill in for this. It will always be equal to that. Okay, so kind of the same level of difficulty as the first one. Any questions on that? Yeah? Did we get one more sign? That comes from the formula for cosecant. It's a reciprocal identity. So this is all about substitution. You take something 
and you substitute in something that it's equal to, it's always going to be one of those 11 formulas from the other page. I think there were 11. Yeah, there were 11. How do you know when you should use a quotient identity over a reciprocal identity? Uh, it really depends on the problem. So like with this one, how did you know? Well, because the only trick I've taught you so far is to change everything to sines and cosines. So that's why I did oh, that. Yeah. But in general, if somebody just gave me an identity, how would I know to do that? Uh, I don't know. It's, there's no like formula that I can say. If you have this and this, then always do that. It's kind of like playing, playing chess. I can't say to just always just take this piece and move it here and you'll win. Well, it depends on what else has happened in the problem. And that dictates what you need to do. So it's it's a little hard. This type of stuff can be a little harder because of that. But with practice, um, like anything, you start to get used to what you need to do. And there's only so many things you can do. This isn't even as complicated as chess, because with chess, there are thousands of options of what you could probably do. Well, when you play an entire game. With this, there's really only going to be like two or three things that you need to think of and decide which one each time. So there's not there's not that many choices. Okay, so this problem we did was a simplified. We're going to do a problem in a minute that's a verify. The difference with simplify and verify is verify gives you something complicated, and they tell you what the answer is going to be when you're done. You just have to figure out how to turn this into that. With simplify, you never really know when you're done. They give you something complicated, and you just keep going until you think you're done. There's usually a somewhat obvious point when you are done, like this one. I mean, you've got it to secant. That's a single trig function. What else are you going to do with it? There's nothing else to do. So that's why I, I like the verifies a little bit more, because I already know where I'm supposed to get, and I know where I'm starting. I just have to figure out the path from what they give me as the starting point to what they give me as the final answer. And the kind of verify problems that we're doing will always work. I wouldn't give you a problem that says verify, and it's impossible. Now, in like a higher level class, would they give you one that could say verify and, and it's impossible? Well, yeah. So then your first step is to even figure out, okay, can I even do the problem that you're doing? Then I have to figure out how to do it. But for us, you're always going to be able to do the problem. So this is the approach that we're generally going to do when we have a verify problem. They'll give you something more complicated, and then they'll give you something simpler on the other side. We are always going to take the more complicated side and work with it until we simplify it, and it becomes the same as the other side. It's much easier to take something that looks complicated and simplify it than to do the reverse of that. You don't want to take something that looks simple and try to complicate it. I just go back to this for a second. You would want to work with this stuff and try to turn it into this. Don't try to take this and make it more complicated and turn it into that. In fact, that's going to be a lot harder to do. So that's the approach we're always going to do. I'm not even going to talk about uh, any other approach. That. So another trick that you can use to simplify a problem, besides taking everything and changing it to sines and cosines, is this. Rewrite a problem with a common denominator. Why? Because common denominators allow you to add things together. 
And of course, if you have two fractions that are separate, and you can combine them together, I would say combine together is simpler because now you only have one instead of two. And the whole idea is when you do any of these tricks, whether it's change the sines and cosines or find a common denominator, something is going to happen that cancels out stuff in your problem. That's what's always going to happen. Remember, when you have fractions, if you have the same thing in the top of one fraction and the bottom of the other, and you're multiplying, you can cancel it out. But when you're doing addition, if you had something like this, you definitely cannot cancel those threes. If you cancel those threes, you're saying that this adds up to two eighths. No. Two thirds plus three eighths is not two eighths. At all. So with addition, the only thing you can do is find a common denominator and put them together. You can't cancel threes like that. Only multiplication. So how would you know if you're going to be doing a problem that has a common denominator? Well, you're going to look for fractions. I don't see any fractions in this problem right now. So I'm not doing anything with common denominators yet. Maybe fractions will come up as we go through it, but I wouldn't worry about fractions right now. So if you look at this, okay, don't, don't even look at what's in these boxes. Just look at this pattern. What property would you use to simplify something like this? Yep. Distributed. Distributed. So we're going to do that as our first step. We're going to do distributed. Now, if you're looking at it and you're like, well, how would I know to do that? Why, maybe I would change the sines and cosines first. That's fine, too. With these kind of problems, there is more than one way to do it. And that's what usually can trip people up. It's not like I can say how to do it every time. It's a little different every time. But I would, I would do the distributive property first. So you're going to have sine times cotangent plus sine times tangent. That's how you do it. Okay, now you've, you've done the distributive property. I still don't have any fractions, so I'm not thinking about common denominators yet. But what trick could I use now that we used before? Yeah. Okay, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna put some we're gonna definitely put some ones in the bottom of some things. And what else are we gonna do? Yeah. Could you change the cotangent and tangent to the quotient engines? Mm -hmm. You have to. That's the only thing you can do to try to simplify this. Change everything that's not a sine and cosine into a sine and cosine. And because I'm going to start getting lots of fractions, I'm going to make everything a fraction now. Um, so now, what is cotangent? Um, cotangent is cosine over sine. Cosine over sine. Sine, I'm just going to leave that. And what about tangent? Yeah. Sine over cosine. Now, before we start multiplying things out, I always look for things that are going to cancel first. Um, is there anything here that cancels? Yeah? The signs on the left. Yes. You cannot cancel the signs like this one with this one. No way. Those are across a plus sign. You cannot cancel across a plus or a minus sign. Multiplication? Yep. You do that all day. All right, that's all that cancels out. So we're left with cosine over 1 plus, and now multiply straight across. You treat sine times sine just like you would do x times x. And be careful, it's not sine plus sine, it's sine times sine. Yeah? Um, sine squared theta. So sine squared theta, and the bottom is just 1 times cosine. So now we've distributed, 
We changed everything to sines and cosines. So changing to sines and cosines won't work again. You've already done it. So what's the trick I just mentioned we could try on this one now? So what was the last trick I did? Nope, that's across a plus sign. So yeah, we can't do that. You get a common denominator. You need a common denominator. And when you have any fractions, the way you get common denominators, one way to do it, is just to multiply the two denominators together. So if you wanted to do that in this problem, and you wanted to make each denominator a 15, you'd have to multiply the top and the bottom of each fraction by the other denominator. So like here, I multiply top and bottom by five. Here, I multiply top and bottom by three. And that would give me a 15 in both denominators. And then I would have 10 plus 12, and I put that in the top. So let's do that same thing here. What's my common denominator going to be? Yeah? Cosine theta. Cosine theta. Now, this fraction already has the common denominator, so you don't have to modify this one at all. That one stays the same. But this other fraction does not. You need to multiply by something in the top and the bottom that would make this denominator the same as that one. Yep. Cosine. 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 Now the bottom here is cosine times 1. That's cosine. And cosine times cosine. Yep. Cosine squared. Now, that entire thing in the top is something special. Cosine squared plus sine squared. It should look kind of like one of the groups of identities that we wrote down. Does anybody see what group of identities it looks like? We'll look specifically at which one in a minute, but just which, which group. Yeah. Pythagorean. Yeah. Anytime you have something squared, Pythagorean identities are probably going to come up. Do we have a formula for adding cosine squared and sine squared together that tells us what it comes up to? Yeah? Yes, it equals um, 1. It equals 1. We wrote it as sine squared plus cosine squared, but that's the same thing. This entire numerator turns into a 1. And now, we go back to that. 1 over cosine. Yeah? Um, I might be going ahead, but is this just going to be uh, secant? Okay. So that whole thing turns into secant. So look back at what we started with. We started with something that had three different trig functions with a distributive property and addition. And after doing it out, we turned that entire thing into just one trig function, secant. That one's a little harder than the first two. Yeah, that's it's like a little, you know, it's like next level. A little, little harder. Because there's a lot kind of going on there. Any questions on those? Any any of the steps that I did? And I can keep showing problems all day. It's not gonna make sense to you try to do it and then you get stuck and you try to work through it. But that's the only way you start to figure these things out. But I'll, I'll show you a couple, couple of times. Okay, finally our first verify. So, again, nice thing about verify is I know what to start with, and I know where to stop. So we're always going to take the more complicated side. I think it's pretty clear which side looks more complicated here. But can somebody tell me which, which side do you think is more complicated? Yeah. The right side. The right side. Yeah. So we're going to work with the right hand side. And we're not going to do anything with the left. This left side is just going to hang out up there the whole time. We're just going to hope that when we're done working with this, 
we somehow get that. But at least we know what we have to get to. That's the goal. All right, so I'm going to copy it. Let's see, can tangent plus cotangent. And a lot of times when we start to work through the problem, it does look worse before it gets better. Right? It starts to look like, even if you look at the last one, it started to look like there was even more stuff in the problem partway through. But then eventually, it, it started kind of collapsing down and it got simpler. Okay, so any suggestions what I uh, do with all that? Yeah? Um, make secant theta 1 over cosine theta. Okay, so I'm going to change everything to sines and cosines. I like that. This 1 over cosine is going to hang out up there for the, pretty much the whole problem. It's the bottom that we're going to be working with. Um, what about tangent? Sine theta over cosine theta. Sine theta over cosine theta. Okay. And what about cotangent? Yeah. One over tangent. Um. Well, see, that would be a different way of doing the problem. Maybe you you can write this as one over tangent. You can't cancel it with this other tangent. Um. But if you have, I'm just that's that's what I'm leaning towards. I just don't know if that method that you said would be faster, um, because then you'd have one over tangent. You'd need a common denominator. Um, so tangent squared plus that. Uh, let's just stick with the sine and cosine. Again, not saying you couldn't do it that way. I'm sure you could, but. We kind of started on this path, so let's continue this way. Okay, there's not really a lot you can do with the top. Okay? But in the bottom, I have two separate fractions. Sine over cosine plus cosine over sine. What do I need if I want to put those fractions together? Yeah? I need a common denominator. Okay, so let's keep the top. What is the common denominator of those two fractions? Can you find it the same way you would find it if it were numbers? Yeah? Would you like get the common denominator just by multiplying sine? Times. Sine times cosine? Sine times cosine. Just like if these were numbers. The common denominator is the product of the two. Now you need to make each fraction match that. So look at your first fraction. It has cosine. What is that fraction missing to make its denominator look like the common one? Yeah. Sine. Sine. And any time I end up with sine times sine, that's usually a good thing because that's going to be sine squared. I'm going to hope I get a cosine squared somewhere else, and I'm going to hope I can use that Pythagorean identity we learned. All right, well, let's keep going. Look at your second fraction. That has a denominator of sine. What do we have to multiply that by to make it match the common denominator? Yeah. Cosine. Cosine. Okay, so the bottoms are done. Sine times cosine and sine times cosine. That's exactly what we have there. Now we need to do the top. What's sine times sine? Yep. Sine squared. So I get sine squared plus what's cosine times cosine? Yep. Cosine squared. Cosine squared. And now I think we've hit the point in this problem where it's got as big as it's going to get. It's now going to start collapsing. It's going to get smaller. So the top is still 1 over cosine. But what simplifies in the bottom? Yeah. Sine squared plus uh, cosine squared equals 1. Yeah. Sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. Yes. Oh, you forgot your. Okay. 
So sine squared plus cosine squared all turns into 1. That's all I'm going to do with this step. Change that to a 1. Now we're back to where we were, or back to a point we were at in another problem, where we have a fraction divided by a fraction. So how do we handle dividing a fraction by a fraction? Yep. Multiplication. Okay, tell me what to do. So you're going to multiply 1 over cosine theta by um, sine theta times cosine theta over 1. So, whoops, I listened to what you said. Okay, so now we multiply those together, and what's going to happen there? Yeah. Cosines cancel out. And what are we left with? One times sine is sine theta. Now, we scroll back up, because there's nothing else we can do with that, and we hope that that was what we wanted to get. So if we go back up, Yep, that's exactly what you want. So we just proved that when you simplify all of this, you do get sine theta. Is that the only way to prove it? Definitely not. Is it the best way? I have no idea. Yeah. So if there was a problem that said to verify it and it didn't come out correct, what would you say? Uh, well, then the question wouldn't say verify. It would say verify if possible, and if it's not, then we would do what's called a counterexample, but we're not getting into that. Okay. So if I ask you to verify, then it will verify. If it doesn't, you did it wrong. Is that something that, that is, happens in calculus? It, it is possible. You may not know what something equals, and you could try to verify something that's impossible. Yeah. Okay. Then that gets frustrating, because no matter what you do, it's not going to work. So we have other techniques to figure out if you should even be trying to verify the problem, and then if you should, then you do what we did. Yeah. So you just leave the denominator as sine times cosine? Uh, yeah, it stayed as sine times cosine until I flipped and canceled okay. at the end. Something's got to cancel every time. That, that's how these problems work. Right, so I'll show you the, um, the last trick. And uh, we'll do one of that type of problem, and that'll be it. So the first trick we have is changing to sines and cosines. We're going to use that a lot. The second trick we have is writing with a common denominator. And the third trick is to multiply by what's called the conjugate. We've done conjugates before. Where we've seen conjugates is when we had problems like this. And we had to simplify it. We're not doing imaginary numbers here. I'm just showing you where we used it before. To solve a problem like this, you had to multiply the top and the bottom by the conjugate. Does anybody remember what the conjugate of 2 plus r would be? Yeah. Is it 2 negative i squared? Um, no, that's not it. No, that's not the conjugate. It's, it's pretty. It's a simple idea. Yeah. Two minus i. Two minus i. The conjugate is when you have two things added together, and you change the sign of what's between. So how do you know if a problem is going to have a conjugate? Well, that's how you solve it. First thing you look for is a fraction, and then in the fraction you look for two things added or subtracted. Here, there were no fractions, so this would not be a conjugate problem. Uh, when we did this one, we had two things multiplied together, but they weren't fractions, so it wouldn't be a conjugate problem. The conjugate problem is going to have the fraction, and usually you're going to have a number in the bottom plus a trig function. It could be like 2 plus sine, or 3 plus cosine, but it's usually going to be a number plus or minus a trig function. Now this last problem had a fraction, it had something added, but one of them wasn't a number. It was a trig function and a trig function, so no, no conjugate there. 
going to be very obvious when you need to use a conjugate. And I'll show you what it looks like. That's absolutely a problem where you're using a conjugate. You have a fraction, and you have a number, plus or minus, trig function. Here's another one where, well, actually that's a little different, but this is definitely one where you would use a conjugate. Uh, another one would be like if you had something like this, sine x over 1 plus tan. And I'm not doing that one because I don't even know if that works out nice. But it has a trig function, plus or minus a number. That's the pattern to look for with conjugates. Now, I said to start with the side that looks more complicated. I don't really think either side looks more or less complicated. They look about the same. I mean, you've got two different trig functions with a fraction and a number. Well, you've got two different trig functions with a fraction and the number is in the top. Um, so you can start with either side if you want. It's not going to make this any more or less difficult. Um, let's use, no, let's do the left hand side. So let's see if we can simplify the left-hand side. Well, it's not even really going to simplify. Let's see if we can turn the left-hand side into the right-hand side. Okay, so changing to sines and cosines. No, nope, it already is. Rewriting with a common denominator. No, nope, you only have one denominator on the left-hand side. So the only thing we can try is the conjugate. What's the conjugate of 1 minus sine? Yep. 1 plus sine. 1 plus sine. Now, any time you have conjugates, this is kind of like all of a sudden becomes the most important thing you're doing. Don't worry about doing anything else in the problem at this step. Just FOIL out your conjugates. And 100% of the time, something else is going to cancel out. So leave the top alone for now. Do not distribute the cosine. Do your conjugate first and just see what happens. So leave it as cosine times 1 plus sine. Now let's foil out the bottom. What's 1 times 1? One? 1. 1 times sine gives me sine. sine. And 1 times negative sine? Negative sine. And what's positive sine and negative sine? Zero. So those are gone. And then I have a negative times a positive. Well, what's a negative times a positive? Negative. Negative. And what's sine times sine? Sine squared. Sine squared. Now, look at the bottom. It looks kind of like something. What What does the bottom kind of look like? Yeah? One of the uh, Pythagorean identities. Yeah, it, and it, it is. Write this down. It's that identity, it's just we moved some things around. What would I have to do on each side to make this identity look like that? Yeah? Sine squared. Subtract the sine squared. And subtract the sine squared. If you move the sine squared to the other side, it says that 1 minus sine squared is equal to what? Cosine squared. So don't do anything in the top. Just leave it the same. But the entire bottom turns into what did we just say 1 minus sine squared is? Yeah. Sine squared. Cosine squared. Now, look at what you have there. You have a common factor in the top and the bottom. How many copies of cosine do you have in the top? One. One. How many copies of cosine do you have in the bottom? Two. Two. So how many do they both have in common? One. 
one. Then you can cancel one out from the top and one out from the bottom. And look at what's left in the top. What's left in the top? One plus sign. And what's left in the bottom? What? Cosine. And remember, this was the left-hand side we were working with. Go back up and look at the right-hand side. One plus sine over cosine. One plus sine over cosine. We just turn the left-hand side into the right-hand side. Now, in this case, is there really that big of a benefit of doing what we just did there? Not as much as in the other problems. I wouldn't really say that this got a lot simpler with all that work. It kind of looks about the same. Didn't really do much. But that, that's the third trick that comes up. Any question on that? All right, so these identities, they, they're, not, um, they're not the easiest topic. It's, it's definitely more abstract okay, than kind of stuff we did yesterday. But we can go over some questions tomorrow, and if um, anybody wants to come for extra help, if you have a study period later in the day, or you can come after school, or you have a study period before this class, um, you could always come see me any of those times. I'm free most periods. Actually, today I'm free the rest of the day. I, at most points, I could help you. Uh, I can. Let me put this up first. Let me just double check. It. One of them says to graph it on the calculator. You don't have to do anything with a calculator. So ignore anything it says about using a calculator. Um, So that's, that's the homework, 4 through 7, 11, 12, 21, 25, 26. Not a lot of questions, but again, some of the identities people get tripped up on. What I'll do is I'm going to put a list of topics that will be on the test at the end of the video, and I'll make sure that that's on YouTube probably in about 20 minutes.